their dinner. And welcome again to the Martin McDonough Gymnasium and Lenny Burke Court, a space that so many things have occurred. Spring training for baseball and softball, Holy Day masses, musicals and plays on the stage, final pregame prep talk for football, beginning of the school year assemblies, pep rallies, project help, graduations, and yes, of course, basketball. So in this place that so many memories have made it's, and will continue to be made, it's appropriate that we celebrate, honor our past here in this space, giving thanks for our honorees, Rose Maria Doran, former principal of Christ King School, J. Brian Hart, and Robert McClellan. First, <clears throat> first some acknowledgments. Our principals, CKS principal Lila Millard, and MSJ principal Michael, Exe Michael Alexander, and any faculty from MSJ, and Christ the King that may be here. Our development office, Kathy Bove, Carrie Savage, and our new director of development, Brooke Duffy. Our program designer, Katrina Wing Clark. Our solicitors for the program advertisements, Frank Trombetta and Sarah Harvey. And members, finally, of our founding religious order, the Sisters of St. Joseph, who are here today, founding our schools in the 1800s. And also with them is a surprise guest, Monsignor Mayo, making his way down from Barry. And I'll have some further acknowledgments later in the evening. At this time, I would like to invite Carrie Savage and Francesca Bove forward. to apologize to Kathy. We had to sneak up on her. She never would have let us do this if she'd known it was going to happen. Um, we have to thank Kathy Bove tonight for this, um, this event, which she has so flawlessly put on and so many people have enjoyed over the years. And behind the scenes, nobody knows the torture <laughs> that she's endured. <laughs> whether it was um, volunteers who didn't show up or late nights washing dishes or um, seating charts that were um, seemed impossible because you know there may be conflicts or or and tonight is a seamless reason too she was able to sit me at a table where we all have a connection at this table um, and she knows all of this by heart she knows the MSJ community um, on a personal level, and she is dedicated um, to this building, this family, this community, like no one I've ever met. And I've learned so much under her, I have to thank her. And um, it was the development board on her not really leaving the development office, but semi-retiring into a volunteer position. Um, and we wanted to, on this occasion, dedicate the um, dedicate the development office to her and so um, we have a plaque for her and it reads Mount St. Joseph Academy in grateful recognition of Kathleen Weirden Bove class of 72 whose dedication and commitment to MSJ was unsurpassed the impact you have made here will be felt for many generations. 
Thank you. And I spoke to Carrie um, just to say a few words uh, about my mom tonight, about Atan Ho, and I say this in air quotes, retirement uh, from MSJ. Uh, my mom grew up on Crescent Street and attended St. Peter's at MSJ. After getting a nursing degree from UVM, uh, she was a head nurse at Floors at Fannie Allen and then later in Cleveland. Uh, while she enjoyed clinical nursing, she liked best the business part of the job and went back to school after she had four kids and got a uh, master's in administration from St. Mike's in 2003. She joined MSJ as the development director in 2004 on the heels of Jane Aberley and Jean O'Rourke. What might have been simply a job to anyone else was a vocation to my mother. While she never uh, was full-time on the books, she undoubtedly averaged over 40 hours a week uh, for her 15 years because with my mom, the wheels never stopped turning when it came to MSJ. Golf tournaments, annual appeals, alumni relations, you name it, she never missed a beat. MSJ is her passion, and certainly a development is director is a person who raises money. But to my mom, her vision at MSJ was clear, as she always said, this is about the kids of MSJ. Her goal was making a quality, faith-based education available to the students of Rutland County. And every dollar raised help, helped raise, uh, help students achieve that goal, whether it was for scholarship, computers, for technology, musical instruments, or the science lab. She never lost sight of why she did what she did, which is why when she reaches out to MSJ's very generous donors, the donors respond. It is not hard to ask people's support for a cause you believe in in your bones. So tonight we're honoring her retirement, which I can say is just a change to full-time volunteer status. Uh, as a case in point, she uh, organized this dinner tonight. And the development committee has generously voted to name the development office after her. I know I speak on behalf of my siblings when I say that our hope for anyone who sits in that office for years to come is that they are able to bring at least some of the passion that my mom has brought to the position and realize that, as my mom always has, MSJ is about the kids. So congratulations to my mom on her promotion to full-time volunteer. It's amazing to see what she has accomplished throughout the years and what you will accomplish in the years to come. Thank you. for that wonderful reception and uh, thanks to Fran and Carrie for such lovely words and uh, I'm going to keep on a trucking. <laughs> Reminder that the uh, got introduced to this concept of a new uh, fundraiser, the wine pole that is still going on in the back. It's, you might walk out with the surprise sixty dollar sixty dollar bottle of wine that's going on in the back. Some acknowledgments for our overall culinary and environment team. Great thanks to Wally Sabatka for the amazing meal tonight and for his staff to serve us. Barbara and Joe Giancola for the donation of all the glassware, silverware, and dishes from Green Mountain Rental. Mark Foley and Foley Services for the donation of linens. Baker Brothers for the donation of wine and Celebration Rentals for the donation of the tables. And for the team making this all happen, Carol Wasek as always for her expertise, planning, setting up, 
and to our volunteers, Teresa Saher, Teresa Howard, Eileen Bride, Wayne Young, and Tim Collins, and to our many students, and to our many students looking so sharp in those green blazers, huh? As now dessert is served, we'll begin the presentation of our awards. The award of distinguished faculty. I would now invite Marge Barbagallo and Pauline Hackett forward. Pauline just wants you to know that she was my editor. She's not going to speak this evening. <laughs> this evening, I have the great pleasure to introduce Rose Maria Doran. Rosie has continually demonstrated her strong belief in Catholic education. We've read or heard all the accolades about Rosie. However, there are many other facets to her. There is her spiritual side, the educational side, the quirky side, and the get it done side. Her entry into education was unbelievable to say the least. Take a moment to think about this. At the age of 15, Rosie was sent to teach kindergarten by her superior. Kindergarten, can you imagine? What were you doing when you were 15? <laughs> I don't know about you, but at 15, I was probably just a little bit more mature than the kindergarten students that Rosie had in her charge. <laughs> Thus began Rose Maria Doran's illustrious career in education and administration. Rosie believes in the phrase, God will provide. And if not, she will find those who will. During her early tenure as principal, she was determined to bring Christ the King School up to speed in technology. She wanted a computer lab, but unfortunately, there was no room in the budget. Leave it to Rosie. Amazingly, in a matter of just a few days, funding for the lab was secured from local outside sources. That's the way she works. Rosie always knew who and how to ask. Rosie is a true mathematician, unlike me. Her love of the subject was evident every day. She would pop into classes, especially during math instruction. Rosie didn't hesitate to jump in and take over the class. She engaged the students and passed on her love for math. She was a human calculator when discussing budgets and fundraising. As for her quirky side, one minute, who cannot forget her love of quirky socks and sparkly shoelaces? Any student parent or teacher will always remember Rosie's funky holiday socks and colorful laces. As a good Italian, Rosie knew food brings people together. There was her delicious lasagna for the teachers during parent conferences or special lunches. There was the candy jar in her office for the I need a sugar fix. And she always made sure we had Jones's Donut the, mo the morning after concerts or parent conferences. Rosie, Rosie knew that if you fed us, we would come. 
and we did. Rosie loved to share stories. Let me share a couple. I believe there was a story about when Rosie was a young nun. Something about telling the superior to get a shovel, dig a hole, and fall in. She never lost the ability to let people know how she felt. Another story involves Rosie and her closest lifelong friend, Mary Jo. One day, while Rosie and Mary were, were out for a drive, they were pulled over for speeding. They proceeded to explain to the officer that they had a medical emergency. The officer let them go. Rosie and Mary Jo believed they had gotten away with it until they realized the police car was following them. They had no choice but to continue the charade. But I am sure they were laughing all the way. Rosie's commitment to Catholic education was so strong that she spent many Sundays attending masses at all parishes in Rutland County and some beyond extolling the virtues of Catholic education. She asked folks to consider CKS and MSJ for their children, or adopting a student in need to cover the cost of tuition. Her commitment reached the hearts of many, resulting in providing a Catholic education for many students. Rosie believed in giving back to the Rutland community and beyond. She encouraged students to see the importance of being charitable to others, and Rosie led the charge. Leonard Bartenstein, while a student at CKS, wrote this about Rosie. Mrs. Doran engages the entire school in community service, and anything less than enthusiasm would never do, and she fuels the enthusiasm. I would like to share these poignant words from Rosie's adopted daughter, Shauna. The greatest people we know don't need glamour, recognition, or fame. They just need to be told that we see them. We know who they are and what they have done to make a difference in our lives and the lives of others. Rosemary Maria Doran is one of those people. Ro Rosie always closed her conversations, her letters, and her emails with, God bless. So let me close with, God bless you, Rosie, for all that you have done for Catholic education. This honor is well deserved. Hi everybody. I'm I have to say I'm overwhelmed. I didn't think Marge thought of me like that. <laughs> Thank you, Marge. She gave my whole speech. <laughs> Everything she said I was gonna say. So I'm thinking I'm gonna liven up this whole place a little bit. You're gonna sing with me. Who can make the sun rise? Come on. Who can make the sun rise? Sprinkle it with dew. Do you know where that comes from? The music man, right. No, not the music man. Candy man, Willy Wonka. Now, why would I mention Willy Wonka? I'll tell you why. Because that was one of the plays that Christ the King's School performed under the leadership of Sister Cindy. One of the plays. Can anybody here tell me how many plays we did? Shame on you. Any former students of Christ the King here? Any for oh, Riley. Can you tell us? Can any former parents? Mary Lou, you worked on many committee. Many, many. You made costumes. Okay. Well, we had the most marvelous musical director for 13 years at Christ the King, nine of the years that I was there. And she had every single student in the school performing. Music Man, 
Annie, Godspell, Willy Wonka, Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, A Star is Born, Something is Up in Bethlehem. Our children got to learn what it meant to give their voice, thanks to Sister Cindy, who has now gone to God. Now, I wasn't going to start my little talk with that, but I just couldn't help it when Marge said all those things, and I didn't want to be so boring. So I, th I don't think boring was ever used when it came to describing me. Was it ever anybody that knows me? I don't think so. But I think tonight I was going to be a little boring. So I'm just going to give you some things, some of my thoughts, the things that I thought about. What was it about Christ the King's school that was so special in my life? What did Christ the King's school do for me? I know what I did for Christ the King's school, and I know that many of you know. I have to go back to the computer story about the money. The reason I have to go back to that story is because Father Mayo was on vacation. <laughs> and nobody raised money without Father Mayo being there. And by the time Father Mayo came back, we had $75,000. <laughs> and I had to go sit in Father Mayo's office and make a report. And I had to give him that money. And my knees were shaking and my, my voice was quivering. And I handed him the envelope, and he said, what's in here? I said, Father, just look inside. So he looked inside, and he's looking at all these checks and all these people that had given money. And he says, Rosie, there's over $70,000 in here. I said, I know, Father. He said, where did it come from? I said, well, one of our dear dads called everybody up that he knew and said, Christ the King needs computers. you got to give. Who gave 2,500? Who gave 1,000? Who gave 3,000? Who gave 500? How many of you in this room gave to that effort? It was a, yes, I see a couple of hands in the back. Thank you. If you gave to that effort, thank you so much. So then Father said to me, what are we going to do with this money? No, I said, yeah, what are we going to do with this money? I said, well, what do you mean, Father? We can't keep it? I have to give it back? He said, Rosie. These people gave money in good faith, and we're going to use it for what they gave it to us for. And I thank you, Father, for that. I thank you for trusting me enough. So that was one, I had to clarify that story. I just had to let you know that. There were so many things that were happening at Christ the King that it's hard to talk about. And I try to um, uh, compare it. I'll read a little passage to what Christ the King means to me. The very best gift is that anyone can experience those unexpected twinkles of joy that make a magical moment. At these moments, you feel true, deep joy because of a great new insight, a beautiful prospect, or a glimpse into the radiance of another soul. They are the magic moments when life seems better than you ever realized. This is what being in the CKS community did for me. It gave me unexpected twinkles of joy every day and great new insights in magic moments, making it better than you ever realized. Being principal of Christ the King's School was like being in the magic kingdom. It was magic when I got to school every day and I walked into classrooms. I met parents on the playground. I went, met teachers. It was magic when students came to my office under the guise of wanting to say hello. But why do you think they really came to my office? Who can tell me? Candy. candy. You got it. All right. They knew I had that candy jar. And guess what? If you look on your tables, you'll find Lynch chocolate. And the reason the Lynch chocolate is there is to sort of look like my candy jar, although it doesn't really. But it, you, you can imagine, OK? Since we're in the world of magic, imagine that candy in a jar. I asked, we would gather for prayer service. Prayer services, how many of us of you came to our prayer services? Anybody ever come? Don't be afraid. Raise your hands. Come on. OK. Yeah, well, you were in them. <laughs> yeah? And Brian, I'm sure you were in them, too, when you were there. Yes? So our prayer services were like magic. 
all of the children would get up and they would put together this beautiful theme of something. It could have been at Lent, and the third graders would be putting together the Stations of the Cross, and you would stand there and watch these little children going around the whole gym, all 14 stations, and the tears would come down your eyes because it was so touching. Before we could get ready for the prayer service, it was quite noisy in the gym. So I developed a method of getting everybody to be quiet. And you know what it was? Who knows? Somebody told me just recently. I stood there. I looked around. Didn't say a word. And in 10 seconds, the room was quiet. And we could do the prayer service. And we had many parents who came and participated with us in those prayer services. I remember one prayer service we did. It was an All Saints Day prayer service. A mom came to me afterwards and she said, Rosie, my son came home and told me what he wants to be when he grows up. I said, what does he want to be? She, I thought, the mom thought he was going to say a fireman or a policeman. He said, no, mommy, I'm going to be a saint. <laughs> and his mother looked at him and said, Jonathan, you can't be a saint. You're not a Catholic. And he looked at her and he said, Mommy, my Mrs. Doran says I can be a saint. So I can be a saint. Now talk about <laughs> listening. Boy, did that kid listen to me, right? And all of you, by the way, everybody, listen. We can all be saints. That's what we're here on earth for, OK? Bishop Montano came to CKS for a meeting. It was a meeting about putting together the two schools. The younger children were not invited. They wanted to be, but they felt it was going to be too long a meeting for them. So what did I do? I had the teachers line the kids up on the sidewalk outside the school. And when Bishop Matano came, he parked the car in front of the rectory garage. He got out, and he saw all these children. And, I, and he was coming up the steps. I said, no, Bishop. These children are here to greet you. You have to go around and greet every one of them. So he went around, and he shook the hand of every single child waiting for him on the sidewalk. Now, I know that that brought magic into Bishop Matano's life because I saw him this summer. And I went up to him to greet him. And he said to me, you're the principal from that school that lined the children up on the sidewalk to greet me. Now, this is 10 years later, and he's remembering this. And he said, I was so honored and touched by that, that I had my driver drive me all around the block two times so that I could see it again. Now, is that magic? Is that not the magic of CKS? It was magic when Sister Cindy had her shows. Every child in the school got to participate, every single one. They didn't have to perform, but they could be backstage. They could be part of putting the, the props together. They could be working the microphone. They could be working the tape. Every child. What do you think that did for all those children? Children that might have felt out of place. It gave them all such confidence in who they were. And some of them have gone on to work in the, uh, the field of music today. That's nice to know, isn't it? We also were in the business of service, as, as Marge pointed out. Service to me was very important. I wanted our children to learn that they've been blessed and others not so blessed. And we have to help them out when they're not so blessed. So we would send food around the community. But we also got involved in big things, like how many heard of the school supplies we sent to the Iraqi children in Iraq? 7,000 supplies that our children collected. Those Iraqi children were delighted. They're, we got their pictures back with all of the supplies in front of them. One of the best musicals we ever did, and you've, got to hear, you've had to hear about this one. How about the Paramount? If you heard about the musical in the Paramount, raise your hand. Kathy, you raised your hand every time. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy and, and Ernie, they're raising their hands every time. And Mary Lou. Because, listen, folks, you, you didn't, was, it was that 
well kept a secret that nobody knew that we were at the Paramount for two nights sold out? It was an amazing, amazing accomplishment. Thanks again to Sister Cindy and the beautiful parents who helped her and who taught the kids. We had 80 children on the stage at the Paramount, 80, dancing, all going in the same direction. <laughs> Every single one of them. You know what kind of a feat that is? OK, I'm getting to the end. I know you can't wait for me to stop. <laughs> it was magic watching our children compete in sports teams and learning so much about how to stand on their own two feet and be part of a team. It was magic when Father Mayo came to visit the classrooms and the younger children thought he was the Pope. <laughs> they would ask me, is the Pope coming, Mrs. Dorn? <laughs> It was magic when I visited the classrooms and saw wonderfully dedicated teachers who always contributed their time, talent, and treasure so willingly and lovingly. We all worked together for the children of CKS, not only to teach them their academics, but also to teach them to gain an awareness of God every day. And when we would have faculty meetings, sometimes it was difficult for the teachers to get there on time. So on the intercom, I would go, when the moon hits your eye like a big pizza pie, it is faculty meeting time. <laughs> and that would sort of push them down the hallway into the library where we had our faculty meeting. But they were great, 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 great women to work with. It was magic when the whole school went to mass and the church was filled with prayers and song. One time, we were looking for, uh, the state was interested in getting a voucher system. Believe it or not, they were interested in getting a voucher system for our parents in private schools. So I was interviewed by NPR, and the interview was on the radio. And one of my doctors over in Castleton Medical Center when he met me, he said to me, I heard you on the radio the other day. I said, really? Where did you hear me on the radio? He said, you were on an NPR show talking about vouchers for parents of children in private schools. So I decided that we had to let the people of Rutland know that Catholic schools make a contribution. So I created a banner, and we hung it from the outside of CKS, and it said, CKS, saves the Rutland taxpayers $1,526,287. And it hung there. And people were coming by the school and wondering, how could that be possible? I got a call from the assistant superintendent of schools, and he said to me, Rosie, that can't be right. You have to take that banner down. And I said, no, John, I'm not taking that banner down. It is true. Well, how does that happen? When a child leaves Christ the King and they come over to our school, we can put them in, we can support them. I said, John, you're, a much, you're an intelligent man. Go a little bit beyond that. Think about it. If my fourth grade closes this year, I have 65 kids in that fourth grade class. I couldn't use the whole school as an example. I didn't know if he would be able to understand it. So, <laughs> so I used the fourth grade class. I said, if you had to put 65 children in your public school in Rutland, we, we didn't count the kids that lived outside of Rutland, where would you, what would you have to do? You'd have to pay for teachers, you'd have to pay for classrooms, you'd, you'd have to pay $11,000 times 65 kids. Do you have that in your budget this year? So support us, John. Support the Catholic schools in town. We need the public school support so that we can continue to do our work. And you can continue to do your work. Let's do it, try to do it together. God is joy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. That was one of, oh, the bishop thought that was a great idea, by the way, when he came to see it. But then a few years later, I had to take it down. We got a new mayor, and I had to take it down, <laughs> which was too bad. Oh, by the way. Do you know the statistic for the, the whole country? The Catholic Church saves 
taxpayers in the whole nation, $236 billion. Now, if you think Catholic education isn't viable, there you have it. That, you should, we should think about that, and we should fight to keep our schools open. Okay? Thank you. God is joy. Our gospel is a gospel of joy, and there, are, there was lots of joy in our magic kingdom. The joy of the gospel, the joy of a loving school community, the joy of smiles, magic. Before closing, I would like to especially mention those teachers whose lights shone on us for a while, and now they are shining from heaven. Rosemary Webster, Sister Patricia Dolan, Sister Marguerite Blackburn, Dr. Al Calabrese, Jean Bean, Sister Cynthia Rouleau, Natalie Casco, Steve Bugor. May they rest in peace. I want to thank the Sisters of St. Joseph, who have, with their vision, 50, 60 years ago, 100 years ago, 140 years ago, gave us a Catholic system in Rutland that was an excellent system. And we pray that we can continue it in their good name. I want to thank those of our clergy that are here this evening for all the help they give in supporting Catholic education. And let's, all of us, let our hearts be hearts of gratitude. Let our hearts be hearts of joy. Let our hearts be hearts of love. And let our hearts be hearts of hope for the future of Catholic education. Our Catholic schools are a necessary part of our culture where we teach the Gospels, which are lessons for life, and we help our children to realize their responsibility to the communities they will live in. I have one more story for you. I was getting ready to retire, and I walked through all the schools, every single classroom, I visited every single classroom, to tell the teachers that I wasn't going to, the children, that I wasn't coming back. And so they would not feel badly when they didn't see me. So I was in the second grade, little boy raises his hand and said, Mrs. Doran, I know why you're leaving. I know why you're retiring. He said, you're retiring because you're getting ready to go to heaven. <laughs> and I said to this child, you know what? Yeah, I know I'm getting ready to go to heaven, but I hope I have a little more time before that happens. But you know what? We're all getting ready to go to heaven. Isn't that right? Isn't that right? Shake your heads, yes. <laughs> yeah. You don't like to respond, do you? I like interactive. You don't like to, boy, if you were in my classroom, you'd be in trouble. <laughs> so I just, uh, I thank you for listening to me, actually. And I would like to leave you with the following thoughts, things that I said throughout my time at CKS and that were in my last letter. Remember that you are God's hands and voice on earth. Always think of others before thinking of yourself. Do good things everywhere you go and leave each place better than how you found it. And finally, pray, 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 trusting that God is always with you and always hears your prayers. Congratulations, Brian, for your service to the community, and congratulations, Rob, wherever you are, for your service to the community, and I had the great pleasure of working with Rob when his son was at Christ the King School. Mother Teresa said, a smile is the beginning of love, so let's keep smiling. And everybody has, thank you, and everybody has this on their table, so let us all sing together. May the good Lord bless and keep you, whether near or far away. May you find that long-awaited golden day today. May your troubles all be small ones, 
and your fortunes ten times ten. May the good Lord bless and keep you till we meet again. May you walk with sunlight shining and a bluebird in every tree. May there be a silver lining back of every cloud you see. Fill your dreams with sweet tomorrows. Never mind what might have been. May the good Lord bless and keep you till we meet again. You're wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, and God bless you all. Yes. Oh, wait a minute. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. And you weren't when you were in school. They just want you trip. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Rosie, Rosie asked me before we began, I'll say, what do we do? I said, Rosie, I think you'll know what to do. Congratulations. $340. And for 50 50. Break out your tickets. 018792. 018792. $340. 018792. We have a winner. Now we gotta match it up. <laughs> Got it? Got it. Congratulations. On behalf of the Condetta and the Howard family, we donate it back to the schools. I'm very good. Donated it back to the schools. Thank you. <laughs> And a word of thanks to Terry Cors Corsones for our dessert, both cake and ice cream, this evening. For the conferral of the MSJ Spirit Award, I would now invite Michael McCormick forward. Good evening. First, I'd like to congratulate Rosie and Brian on their awards. And uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Rob McClellan as this year's recipient of the MSJ Spirit Award. Rob grew up on Birchwood Avenue here in Rutland and attended Christ the King School. In the spring of 1965, he was about to graduate from the eighth grade and that is where our paths crossed. Rob and I met while attending a CKS graduation party at the home of one of Rob's classmates. I went to IHM, so I may or may not have been officially invited. <laughs> uh, I met Rob and many of the other CKS, soon to be MSJ students that night, and we all hit it off famously. Something happened, I don't remember quite what it was, but the mom of the student hosting the party was, I am sure, concerned for our welfare and suggested that we get an early start on our walk home. <laughs> I'd like to say that that was the only time management has asked us to take our act elsewhere, but that might not be exactly accurate. 
You can see that Rob and I have been friends for a long time, so I have a lot of stories. But I'm not sure the statute of limitations have run on most of them. <laughs> I'm sure that I also would be implicating about half of the room. <laughs> so I'll try to stick to Rob's history and connection to Christ the King and MSJ. It suffices to say that we're very glad there was no such thing as Facebook, Instagram, or any other form of social media during our formative years. After graduation from Christ the King, Rob followed in his sister and his brother's footsteps and started at MSJ in the fall of 1965. Rob was a good student, National Honor Society, and many other scholastic awards. He was also active in many extracurricular activities, sports, plays, community projects, and was our class president our junior year. In my mind, though, there's two things that happened in those four years that sent Rob on his path towards his future profession. First, in our junior year, we all had to take Algebra II from Sister Agnes Marie. She was tough, and it was a long year. At the end of the year, we were told whether we could go on to take a pre-calculus course our senior year, along with trigonometry, taught by our own Sister Shirley here tonight. Sister was far from po politically correct, so there was no closed door meetings with our parents <laughs> to see who was going to go on and who wasn't. We all lined up in alphabetical order, <laughs> and you were told whether or not you would be able to take Math 5. So Sister would stare down at her infamous grade book, and uh, so we lined up and uh, it kind of went uh, McCann, McClellan, McCormick. So as M Mr. McCann went up to the front desk, sister would look down and she goes, absolutely. So Rob went up to the desk and she's looking at her grade book and looking up at him, looking at the grade book. She goes, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> I know it was very funny to a lot of us, but I think Rob knew right then that any profession that included any kind of higher math skill was not for him. The second occurrence was either our junior or senior year, I'm not sure, we were told to write a poem with an Easter theme. There was a statewide competition of some sort, and we were told to enter. While the rest of us toiled to come up with something of religious significance, Rob's title was The Easter Pig. <laughs> it went something like, the Easter pig is forced to run on stubby legs, and so he sweats and gets his Easter eggs all wet. I know Rob can recite the whole thing for you later, but you get the picture. Well, that tongue-in-cheek entry went on to win an award as the judges <laughs> thought it was a satiric masterpiece. <laughs> it was then that Rob knew he should move in a direction where words and his wit would somehow be involved in his future profession. After we left MSJ, Rob went on to Middlebury College. He always says he had a double major there, but I seem to remember that the college just changed the name of the major from American Literature to American Studies. <laughs> After college, he decided to follow his dad into the law profession. Rob attended Albany Law, School, Albany law School, and he graduated in 1976. He returned to Rutland, went to work for a local firm to get some experience and pass the bar. My roommate had just moved out, so Rob and I had our bachelor pad on the mountain. Rob bought a duplex on Grove Street in 1978, and we moved back to the city. Once he was back in Rutland, MSJ came calling. He volunteered to speak to the students about a career in the law. He went to school to visit classrooms with our recent alums to help the students understand what it took to become an attorney. Now, the drinking age was only 18 in those days, so I was quite taken aback when a group of young women approached us at his cousin's bar and started calling him Mr. McClellan. He assured me that they were just some of his students asking about some more questions about the law. I got married in 79. Rob was still single, living in the apartment on Grove Street, and he continued to volunteer at MSJ. He was a ski coach, if you can remember that, during those years, and very successful teams. In the fall of 81, when my wife was pregnant with our firstborn, she would encourage me to leave the house on Sunday afternoons so she could get a nap. 
I'd meet Robbie and Coach at Brian Costello's pub to watch the Giants. On those Sundays, it seemed like his wife, Janet, would also arrive at the pub with her friend and sit at a table. We all would say hi, and that would be it. And then when Coach would leave to go sign the book at the Elks, all of a sudden, Robbie zing over to the table, he'd go. It took me a few Sundays to figure out that uh, something was up. And uh, apparently only both women can put up with McClellan men, so Rob and Janet were soon married. They love following their nieces and nephews in many endeavors here at the MSJ. And uh, it sure didn't hurt any that the Lazinski kids were about the same age at the time, and so many of the events ended up with uh, capped off time at the carriage room afterwards. But they indeed were staunch supporters of MSJ during that time. Rob and Janice, two boys, were born soon after, and before they knew it, their boys were at CKS. So it was kit sales, candy bar sales, walkathons, class trips, sports, and many other committees that Rob and Janet supported to benefit Christ the King. I always said that along with their Christ the King diploma, the students always should get a minor in marketing. <laughs> After the boys graduated from Christ the King, Matt went on to MSJ and Mike went to Rutland High School. Rob and Janet continued to serve both schools, volunteering to help at many of the MSJ and RHS events. Rob has practiced law for over 40 years in the Rutland region, most of those years on his own. And for those of you who have not had the privilege of trying to make sure you have enough money to make payroll each week, believe me, that's quite an accomplishment. It is also a testament to Rob's fair, accurate, and practical legal advice that he has provided to many of us in the Rutland region. Both of his boys have returned home and decided to follow in their grandfather McClellan and their father's path. They joined Rob in the practice of law here in Rutland. I know, Mike and Matt, that your dad loves to give you a hard time, but believe me, he couldn't be happier or prouder to have you both all together at McClellan and Associates. Rob has spent many volunteer hours, not just in support of the MSJ community, but in many other professional and nonprofit organizations, which I think is indeed the true spirit of MSJ, is to support all those in need of help. Rob currently serves as the chair of the Valenti Golf Tournament in the spring and the Mike Baker Memorial Tournament in the fall. He also serves on the development committee here. Rob has been a true Mountie, and we thank him and his family for all their support over these many years. I am proud to present this year's spirit of MSJ Award to our friend, Robert P. McClellan. Thank you. He sounded so sincere. He could be a lawyer, not an accountant. He was very good at that. So, the Easter pig, with all his eggs, is forced to run on stubby legs. He always seems to pant and sweat and gets his Easter eggs all wet. That went to the Catholic Daughters Poetry Society. Sister Clementine was the one who got me into this. And she had one suggestion. If you're gonna win, you gotta change the title. So, we changed the title to In Search of Status. And she looked at me and said, oh, now I get it. Well, apparently they did too, because I won. It was like this insane thing. But anyway, um, thanks very much for this honor. I really, I really do appreciate it. Uh, there's a lot of people that deserve it more than I do. The things that I do at MSJ are fun. Uh, I don't do any of the heavy lifting. Golf tournaments, that's not heavy lifting. Uh, Kathy Bove and her staff do all of that. Uh, I just have fun doing it. Mike Baker. We named a tournament after Mike, and uh, one of the things that struck me about Mike was when you talk to his friends after his untimely death, they always said that the thing about Mike Baker was he did a lot of good, but he always had fun doing it. And I've tried to do that at MSJ. I think it's, it's a formula that works. Um, this school is taking off. It's terrific. And honoring our past is a marvelous thing to do, but we gotta start focusing in the future. Uh, the past is the past. It's been really great to us. 
we got a bunch of kids here that are really going to make a difference in the world. And so I'd urge every one of you to get involved with this school. There's a lot of things you can do. And one thing I've learned, because I'm standing here, is that you don't really have to be good at anything to make a difference. You just got to show up, you know? It's not that hard. There's a lot of people that will help you along. It's not like the old days when you'd volunteer for bingo and they'd throw you out of the place because you called a number wrong. They really are grateful for you to come here. So anyway, I hope everyone takes tonight away uh, and, and dedicates themselves to make sure that this school is here for the other generations, not the way that we had it, but the way it should be in the future. These kids are going to make a difference. Thanks so much. the conferral of the Un Unsung Hero Award, I would now invite Richard Freed forward. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, and my fellow alumni, thank you for inviting me here this evening to help honor my friend Brian. While it's been 20 years since we roamed these halls together, I'm sure many of you can still remember the impact Brian had on our school and this MSJ community. For someone who led our teams to state championships in football, basketball, and track, Brian could have cast a much larger shadow. But Brian was always an unsung hero. You may recall his heroics on this very court, but I will always remember his little acts of heroism. Brian was the first one of us to get his license. And for the next four years, we'd all pile into that gold van, <laughs> knowing that whatever mischief that we got in ourselves into, or more likely tried to get ourselves into that night, we'd have a safe and responsible ride home. And that is an invaluable service. <laughs> After MSJ, Brian went on to excel at Amherst College in Georgetown Law, and was rewarded with a great job at a big shot Washington, D.C. law firm. But the call to service was too great, however, and after seven years, Brian made the bold, brave, some might say crazy decision to <laughs> give it all up and start a nonprofit to help the homeless in Washington, DC. Brian recognized a major gap existed for homeless families who were lucky enough to be transitioning into affordable housing. These families, while grateful for having a roof over their head, more often than not were sleeping on the floor. Most cannot afford furniture, and even if they could, would have no way of transporting it. Think about how challenging it is for us to move, and imagine trying to do that as a disabled veteran or a single mom. So Brian created Lighthouse DC to collect donated furniture and partner with moving companies, interior designers, and local volunteers to turn housing units into homes. If you ever need a break from the negativity and noise that's swirling around us these days, I urge you to type in Lighthouse DC into YouTube. There you can see incredibly moving videos of some of the hundreds of families Brian and his team have helped. And if you're like me, you'll probably cry your eyes out too, so fair warning there. <laughs> Brian himself will tell you that it is impossible to honor him without honoring his family as well, some of whom are here tonight. His father Jay, who, no matter how old I get, will always be Mr. Hart to me, <laughs> helped instill Brian's legendary work ethic and was always ready with words of wisdom or, uh, or a wisecrack to make us feel better when we needed it. Brian's Uncle Fred and his husband Dave, who taught us that love is love and to always be true to ourselves. His wife Allie, who, despite all these wonderful things I'm saying about Brian tonight, is still way out of his league. <laughs> <laughs> His brothers, who remain his closest friends to this day, and last but not least, his mother, Nan. Mrs. Hart dedicated her life to community service, helping countless senior citizens here in, here in Vermont stay active through volunteer work. Thank you, Mrs. Hart.
So when the opportunity came to form a company to commercialize my uncle's stem cell and gene editing technology, I knew I had to recruit Brian. Not because we had always talked about starting a company together since we were kids or the fact that I actually needed a lawyer with a background in intellectual property. <laughs> but the reason I, I really wanted Brian on the team was because the disease that we seek to eradicate from this planet happens to be rheumatoid arthritis. The very disease Mrs. Hart and millions of others across the world um, suffer from. So as Brian was contemplating coming aboard and turning over some of his lighthouse responsibilities to his deputies, we had to have a little discussion about some financial matters. Right? <clears throat> I asked him, so how much are you uh, taking in salary these days from the lighthouse? And he said, well, so I'm still trying to make sure Lighthouse is on solid ground and we have more than enough resources to take care of all the families that, um, that we're working with, um, that, he, that he still wasn't taking a salary. Imagine that. Gave up everything to help all these people and still wasn't taking a salary. So I said, perfect, I can match that. <laughs> <laughs> the rest was history. <laughs> I will be forever grateful to Brian and the Hart family for the road we have traveled together, and for the journey ahead. The world needs more unsung heroes. But for one night, please join me in thanking Brian for being my friend, my brother, and my hero. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. I've been planning for years some way to get Rich up on a stage saying nice things about me. <laughs> and now he's done it twice in, in a year with me getting married last year. So um, I'm truly honored to be here. Uh, thank you so much. It's wonderful to see so many familiar faces in the crowd um, that I have known over the years. Sister Shirley, Father Mayo, um, all of our wonderful teachers. And I just said to Allie today that you know you leave for 20 years and you come back and it strikes you how beautiful a place Vermont is. And I, I love Rutland and I love Vermont and, and I'm just so happy to be back here. Uh, Rich, you kind of stole my thunder thanking everyone at the head table here. But just to, just to emphasize that, I'm so grateful to my family and friends, uh, my uncle and Dave who are here, my brother Riley, Rich's parents, the Freeds, who have been second parents to me and then my, my wife, Allie's parents, who are here as well. So thank you so much. Um, I'd like to share a little bit about why MSJ means so much to me, the MSJ and CKS community, and some of the values that I take away from it. Um, I think back to when I first moved here at eight years old. I was a um, you know, disruptive, smart kid who they basically tried to put on Ritalin back in Pennsylvania because I was disrupting the classroom. And to come here, I, school had always felt impersonal to me. It had never felt like a place where it was really home. And I would go home and love being home, and then I would go to school. And that would just sort of be a place that I would check in. But when I came to CKS, that really changed. And I felt like I was at home. It was really a second community for me. And there were teachers like Mrs. Keeler and Mrs. Beam and Mrs. Barbagallo and Mrs. Hackett, who are here tonight, um, who really showed that affection for us and respected us, even though we were kids, and really made me ha have that feeling of being at home in school and have that community. So. Thank you so much, and I just want to give a round of applause to all the teachers who have made a difference in people's lives. So the, the second value for me that was instilled in me over the years was, was this principle of being kind and caring to people. And you know, CKS and MSJ, are, I guess, are a little bit sneaky about it in the way that they instill that in you. Um, you have volunteer hours and you have service requirements that you have to hit. Um, and at the time, it feels like just another obligation that you would maybe not want to fulfill as a kid. 
So it's almost like the Karate Kid. You know, it's like wax on, wax off. And then years later, you realize Mr. Miyagi was really teaching you something very important. And I think Project Help is a great example of that. Um, we would go out over the holidays and collect food and, and toys and give them back to um, homeless and, and low-income families here in the city. And at the time, you think, oh, this is kind of a day off from school and we get to drive around and go get McDonald's and hang out. And now, you know, reflecting back on that, um, it really is, it is, is so meaningful. I mean, I imagine a family, a young family with two daughters not having a proper meal or the toys for their two daughters at Christmas time. And the fact that we had the opportunity to really bring joy to them over the holidays, it's such a, it's such a powerful thing. And it's something that I think I've really taken with me in my life and, and in my work. Um, the third value for me was this idea of commitment. And we, of course, had commitment in the classroom. And there's self-accountability with your studies, which is important in life. Um, and there's commitment to uh, the church and to our school. Uh, but the third area for me that was so meaningful was, it was commitment in extra, extracurricular activities, and particularly sports. And I have to say that sports have taught me a tremendous amount about life. Um, the, it, because it showed you the commitment that you have to make yes to hard work and to persevere, but also commitment to each other and commitment to a higher purpose than yourself. And I think that was really demonstrated in our senior year when we were able to kind of get over the hump and finally win some state championships. And I love being in this gym where uh, my last high school game we played and we kicked the, we kicked the butts of, of BFA St. Albans. I didn't, we really, we're, we crushed them, we crushed them. Um, but, uh, you know, I think, you know, in football, for example, Coach Grady is here tonight and he's been a great mentor and, and friend for many years. Um, we, we had lost to Rutland repeatedly. And I'm going to reflect a little bit on our, our rivalry. And, you know, we, could, we just couldn't beat them. And, you know, for a lot of the season, it was, you, you had that team goal, but there was an individual aspect to it where you still wanted to get your own touchdowns and your own receptions. And maybe you weren't quite as focused on that team goal as you could have been. And I have to thank Rutland for this. I mean, they kicked our butts, you know, often enough that it brought home this idea. We lost to them in the first, in our last game of the regular season, and we were the favorites, and it was so crushing that I think for us, it focused us. Because I think if you had asked any one of those 50, 17, eight-year-old, 18-year-old you know, kids, young men at that time, what's the most important thing in your life over the next two weeks? All of them would have said, beat Rutland. <laughs> And to have that kind of laser focus on something beyond yourself, that you don't care about your individual accolades or what happens to you, I think is a really valuable thing in life. And that was what we learned in the basketball season as well. And it really guided us. We were the first six seed in the history of the state to, well, well, to make the championship and then to win the state championship in basketball. And it really rang true in that situation as well, because basketball can be a very individual sport in which people are focused on their own points and their own accolades. And what we found at the end of the year, when we actually put our egos aside and just sacrificed and did the little things for the team, that was when we really started winning. And that was really how we were successful. Um, so, you know, in closing, I think this is really meaningful for me. Um, it's a great time to reflect. Um, my parents just moved to Reston, Virginia. They retired, so it's very meaningful for that reason. And my wife and I are expecting our first child in December. So it's a good time to, <laughs> thank you. It's a good time to reflect on education and, and what it means to me as a parent going forward. Um, 
I think I'd like to like just to end by saying that, um, you know, whatever good fortune comes my way or whatever obstacles or challenges I face, you have my word that I will always remain true to you and the values that the CKS and MSJ community have instilled in me. Um, so thank you so much. I love you all and have a wonderful night. generosity in being here tonight. To close our evening, I would invite my fellow alumnus, Father Dick Tinney, forward for the benediction. I know I'm supposed to give the benediction, but I'd like to make a comment before. 62 years ago, I graduated from this place. <clears throat> and if it wasn't for my days here, I wouldn't be here today. So thank God for his goodness and his care, and thank God for MSJ. Also, I was looking at the bleachers back there, and back in 1957 or that area when this gym was built, I was able to help put the first bleachers in. So that was quite a few years ago. <laughs> so time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> well, we do appreciate all the hard work that the people have put into this evening and for all that they do to keep MSJ alive and well and going. And so I praise all you people for being here tonight and for supporting and caring for this wonderful, wonderful institution. So let us pray. Oh, may God, who loves us all, give you his choices, blessings, and fill your lives with joy. May he guide you in your ways and lead you to his glory. And may Almighty God bless you all Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us go in peace.